Well, we're getting down close to the end of this series, and we started this, this is the 11th week, and uh, the name of the series is The Lamb, The Lion, and The Warrior King. And we're looking at a very unique perspective on the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't realize this. When they read the book of Revelation or they hear somebody talk from the book of Revelation, they're a little afraid, a little intimidated. They read about all these things that seem so strange that they're, quite frankly, a little bit scared. But the book of Revelation was written as a letter by John the Apostle. He was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wrote more about love than any other of the apostles or the writers uh, of all of Scripture. And in fact, he wrote the most famous of verses, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He was the disciple that knew about the love of Jesus. And he wrote the book of Revelation not as, and it was apocalyptic literature, which means that it talks about the end times. But God revealed to him in in visions and dreams and and in some ways in direct communication what to write about in the book of Revelation. And the reason he wrote it was to encourage Christians that were being persecuted. Some of them were being put into prison. Some of them were being put uh, to death. And he wrote this somewhere around 95 AD and uh, some 60 years or so, 65 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he wrote it to be an encouragement. Now I realize that if you don't understand that filter, you can read that book. And let's be honest, there are a lot of screwy, uh, funny, different takes on the book of Revelation. You ever, and I'm not mocking these, okay, just understand well, I am a little bit. All right, so, but uh, uh, you, ever, you ever see the, the, the seminars or the sermons where they got gigantic uh, artistic drawings and stuff and timelines all across the stage? Well, that's interesting, but there are multiple uh, viewpoints, if you will, on the book of Revelation. And if you want to know more about that, you go to my YouTube channel, the Stillwaters uh, video on YouTube, and for 13 weeks, I put up an uh, explanation on different parts of the book of Revelation. I know many of you have watched it, and if you do watch it, share it with somebody and encourage them to come to church. But the key to understanding the book is to see it not through the lens of events, but through the lens of a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And we've been talking about for 10 weeks now about all the things that point us to Jesus. Now today what I'm going to do, I'm not going to go read every verse uh, because this is going to cover several chapters of the book of Revelation. Over the next two weekends, I'm going to be talking about eternity and what what is heaven, what does it look like. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great encouragement to you. Because in spite of what you may be going through now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of him, if you put your faith in him, you've got better days to look forward to. There's going to be a better day coming. And when you go to heaven, it is going to be awesome, okay? And, but what I'm going to do today, the title of the message is that Jesus restores. And what we're going to look at is the actual judgments that are described in the book of Revelation that Jesus brings um, to false government, to sin, to evil, to those that um, uh, hurt other people, and we could go on and on. And really the, the, the line of thinking that I'm taking is this. There are some reasons why we should be glad for God's judgment. You say, oh man, that doesn't sound like a good message at all. That sounds very negative. No, it is actually not, because think about this. If it were not for the judgment of God, then we would not know about the love of God. You see how you say, well, the very fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and resurrected from the grave tells us how serious sin really is. And you know the depth of a person's love for you by what they're willing to sacrifice for you. 
And Jesus sacrificed everything. And he didn't just do it for good people. He didn't just do it for religious people. He didn't just do it for church-going people. He did it for every person who falls short of God's standard of perfection. He did it for every person who falls short of the glory of God. And he did it for you and he did it for me. Because I want you to know that in this room, in spite of how good some of you smell this morning, uh, there's nobody perfect in this room. Now, I know that might be shocking to you, but I want you to look at the person sitting next to you and say, you ain't perfect. No, no, no. Let's participate. I know I'll lull you to sleep for a few minutes here at the beginning, but let's try this again. Ready? You turn to somebody and say, you ain't perfect. Ready? Go. Okay. Well, I know why some of you didn't say this and participate because you're sitting next to your wife. All right. And so, and if you say that to her, uh, you are going to get hit upside the head when you leave today. So I get it. Okay. But the point is this. We're going to look at what Jesus does. What is the point of what Jesus is going to hold accountable at the end of time? What is the point? The fact is he restores everything to its right order. I want you to uh, read with me in Romans chapter 8 verses 19 to 21. This will be kind of our jumping off point before we read out of the book of Revelation. It says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are against its will. Now, notice what he's getting ready to describe that happened to the earth when Adam and Eve sinned. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. We know that from the book of Genesis, right? And the story that God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they did. And he, God put a curse on mankind and the earth and so forth. But with eager hope, notice, not just people. Listen to what he says. With eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, I know that we have all kinds of problems nowadays. We had a hurricane down in Florida just recently. But there's coming a day that there is not going to be any more curse on this earth. There's not going to be any more death and decay. And creation itself is looking forward to that glorious hope of the gospel. It is looking forward to that glorious day when God is going to restore everything to its original order. Did you know that when God created, he did not create this world uh, to be under a curse, but to be a blessing. He did not create this world uh, for you and I to experience the toil and the pain that's involved with work. Now, don't misunderstand. Uh, God did not create you to be a, a, a person floating around all eternity and not having anything to do. Work was a glorious blessing before the fall. Okay, but the difference between work before the fall and work after the fall is there was no curse involved. And, and so everything was fulfilling and uh, lifting up to God's purpose. And there would be before the curse, there would be no one of us in this room that would have a bad day at work. We would be gloriously fulfilled. We would be very happy. We would serve God's purpose and we would be fulfilled by our work. And so God is going to be restoring everything uh, to be made right again. And that is the purpose of what he holds the entire creation accountable for at the end of time. He is going to restore uh, everything to its right order. He is going to restore everything for good. It's, good is going to overcome evil. He's going to restore for healing. He is going to store, restore for restoration. And then if you've ever looked forward to any of those things, if you've ever looked at the world situation and thought to yourself, man, that's not right. Or I sure would like to see justice done. If you've ever thought, man, I sure am tired of being sick. I sure am tired of seeing people get disease. I'm tired of seeing my family suffer physically. I I sure am tired of the financial struggles that I go through. I sure am tired of feeling hopeless and depressed 
and down. If you've ever had those thoughts, those feelings, I've got good news for you. Jesus wins. Jesus wins and he is going to restore everything back to its right and original order. So today, probably a bit unique in how I'm going to look at this, but I want to just give you three reasons why we rejoice in God's judgment. Now, that sounds weird, right? Because you're like, well, I don't rejoice in God's judgment. I don't want to be judged. Well, hear what I'm saying. His judgment is not for Christians. It is not for believers. It is not for those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know why? Because God has already judged sin on the cross by Jesus' death for all who believe. And so this judgment is not for you. You say, well, it doesn't seem right that I would be excited about God judging somebody else, God judging another person, even though uh, they weren't a Christian, even though they weren't a follower of Jesus, even though they weren't a believer, I still don't want them to suffer God's wrath. Well, let me just say this. The reason we rejoice in God's judgment is because Jesus puts everything to order again. There is hope that's coming in eternity. There's going to be restoration that comes in eternity. And there's going to be justice that happens uh, before eternity. So, with that said, I want to just give you three reasons why we rejoice in the judgment of God. And the first reason is this. Because he justifies, Jesus we're talking about, Jesus justifies as the Lamb of God. You remember the title of this series, Uh, the lamb, the lion, and the warrior king. Well, that's really my three points today. Jesus justifies as the lamb of God. And as the lamb of God, he paid for our sin. Revelation 7, 9 and 10. And after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. There are going to be countless numbers of people that are going to enter into heaven and enter into eternity because they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And as the Lamb of God, you know what Jesus does? He justifies. And it's not just you. It's not just the people that you grew up around or even the people that you necessarily agree with their style of ministry. I heard about one guy that he died and he went to heaven and St. Peter met him and started giving him a tour of heaven. And he started going through these different places and he said, well, over here in this section of heaven uh, live the charismatics. And all you can probably tell they're a little bit loud over there, but they have a good time. Then he goes on, he says, and over here in this section are the Presbyterians. He said, they're kind of quiet. They're kind of reserved. He said, but they're over there having a good time as well. And he goes down and he's pointing out all the different groups and and they're just talking. And then he gets close to one section. He says, be very quiet. Guy says, why? He said, well, this is where the Baptists are. They think they're the only ones here. (laughs) There are going to be people from every tribe and language and people group under the earth. That is what heaven is going to look like. And it's going to be absolutely awesome. Jesus justifies as the Lamb of God. Revelation 10, 7. In the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be revealed. The mystery of God is talking about the gospel. It's talking about what culminates in eternity. See, the gospel is not finished with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not finished when you get saved. The gospel will not be completely finished until all the people from all of the ages, from all the tribes and nations and tongues and languages on earth are in heaven and Jesus brings justice to the entire cosmos and sets everything back to its original order. That is when the gospel will be finished. And you know what? At that moment, we will enter into eternity and what will happen is you're gonna rejoice and have God's grace and God's love poured out on you for all of eternity. And it's just going to be incredible. And you're going to look at Jesus and you go, man, 
How much grace? He says, just a little more here. And then here's a little more there. And here's just a little more here. And here's a little more love. And here's how much the Father loves you. And here's how much I love you. And oh, by the way, here's how we demonstrate this love to you. And for all of eternity, we're going to receive the end result of the gospel. Jesus, as the Lamb of God, justifies. He brings justice. He gives us justification. And uh, it is important that you and I understand that because of that, he died on the cross. Because of the need for justice, he died on the cross for our sins. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that time that when forever and ever, with no end in sight, there's no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, nothing but unmitigated, unbelievable joy that we have in the presence of Jesus. And it's just going to be incredible. But that would not happen apart from the judgment of God. God judged sin on the cross through Jesus Christ. We should rejoice. Are we glad that other people reject Christ? No, we're not. That's not what we're talking about. But God does bring justice as the Lamb of God. And there is not a person without, that has no excuse, or that has an excuse, rather. You see, because he gives chance after chance. He gives love uh, without end, and he gives us this opportunity. Revelation 14, 1, and then verse 3. And then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, with the 144,000, that's representative of the people that get saved, uh, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads and they were singing a new song before the throne. You see, Jesus justifies because he is righteous. He justifies because he is the redeemer and he justifies because he is the rewarder. And what we must see is that God in his wrath, he pointed it toward Jesus for our sake. If you're one of these people that have this vision of God, that he's a colossal killjoy up in heaven with a giant stick and waiting every chance you mess up so that he can whack you upside the head and giggle, well, then you've got a completely distorted view that is not scriptural view of God. Now, does God have wrath? Of course. Uh, Why would he not have wrath against sin? You have wrath against sin. Let's take somebody that breaks into your house. Maybe they harm your child. Would you have wrath? Of course you would. That would be just and righteous to have wrath. You see some uh, girl that was abducted and was taken as a sex slave. She was stolen from her family and for years she was missing. Does that cause you to be angry? Does that cause wrath? Of course it does. Because only the person that would have no righteousness at all in them, would have no wrath at something like that. Of course, God has wrath, but the Bible only describes him as having wrath, but it describes him that he is holy, he is love. And therein lies a difference. He has wrath, but he is love. And so Jesus is the rewarder. You must see God Through this lens, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, in other words, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, notice the two things that were the qualification. You want to come to God. Now, I don't believe that he's saying that, uh, well, maybe this can apply to salvation. You've got to believe that God will... Uh, answer the prayer of the sinner that says, Lord, I want you to save me, okay? But what we're seeing here is that God wants you to understand that if you want to come to him, in other words, you want to have fellowship with him. There are a lot of people that get saved that don't truly have fellowship with the Father. Do you know that, right? There are a lot of people that uh, they don't have communion with Jesus, okay? And he says, if you want to have that intimate relationship, that trust, that love, that no matter what you go through, you know he's there. No matter what pain you may have, you know that God has a plan. He's not left you. He's not leaving you alone. 
So he says, if you want to come to him, in other words, you want to have that relationship, there are two qualifications. You got to believe that he exists and you got to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now let me ask you a question. Do you see God as the mean kid that pulls the wings off of flies or takes a magnifying glass and burns ants? Do you see God as that way? Sometimes we get in trouble, we have difficulties, and we see God that way. God, why are you being so mean? God, why have you left me? And by the way, you ought to talk to God no matter what, even if it's vertical venting, that's really true prayer. If you think I'm, I'm, I'm lying, read the book of Psalms. David did it quite a bit. Why would you try to hide your feelings from God? He knows what they are anyway. So the point is that if we want to have that relationship with God and, and we want to understand that he is the rewarder, that he's not left us alone. That he does have a plan. We say that and that becomes a cliche. And I realize that can be painful. But do you in the dark moments when you're suffering truly believe that he is a rewarder? That is the test of your faith. And by the way, when you can get to that level of spirituality, that level of trust, then you really can come to him. And for everything that you are going through, God, I'm coming to you for my kids. I want to get personal for a minute. Many of you know, many of you have prayed for our son. His name's Brandon. And this was a young man that got saved at an early age and he got baptized and had such promise. He had some accidents, a couple of uh, very severe head injuries, and there was a period of about 10 years or more, actually, yeah, about 10 years, that it was literally hell on earth for our family. I can't tell you the number of times I've wept over my son. He said he hated me. I can't even begin to tell you the things that he said to me and his mother, and the problems. And some of it was, we believe, related to accidents and so forth, but some of it was just pure rebellion and venom and hate. I don't know if you've ever had a kid that gave you problems. But you know, in the middle of our suffering, we never gave up. We said, God, he's yours. You love him more than I do. He's yours, God. And we, I won't go through all the details, but there was a lot of stuff that we had to do. And just recently, not too long ago, uh, he was finally put out of our house. And I got to tell you that he showed up at my parents' house and God began to work in his life. And this, this past Sunday, he went to the church for the first time in a long time. And he told, he told my mom that he loved me. <laughs> and he admitted that the things that he had done and different things and uh, he's working and God's working in his life and he's beginning to, he's really beginning to, it, my, here's what my mother said. She said, he is our old grandson. He's the old Brandon. And they began to talk about how much he's working and all this stuff. And he said to my mom and to my sister last week, for the first time in a long time, I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> now, let me, let me, and I realize this is a little personal. But let me tell you what we never did, Kim and I. We, oh, we regretted it. We hated it. We hated every minute of, this, minute of that journey. And yeah, we were like, God, how long is this going to be? But we prayed and we never gave up. And my mother, <laughs> she's a very good Christian. She said to me, she said, I don't know what's happened. And she went through this whole list of things that we had been praying for about him starting to go to church, about him uh, coming to himself, about just this ton of things that we were praying for. She said, I don't know what happened. 
I said, wait a minute, mom, you don't know what happened. What do you mean? She said, well, I can't explain it. I said, well, I can. She said, well, what? I said, God answers prayer. That's what happened. So here's the question. Do you see him as a rewarder? Now, for all of that journey, I can't tell you that I was happy. I was not. I can't tell you that I was emotionally strong because there were times that I didn't think I was going to make it. But you know what? I never doubted that God loved me and that God loved my son. And whether or not he ever got right, I knew that God was going to answer prayer. And whether he ever got better or got good or whatever, I knew that God was going to answer prayer. And that's what he did. And my mom's like, well, I don't know what happened. I said, well, I do. God answered prayer. God answered prayer. God answered prayer. And so my question to you is this. In what you're going through right now, it could be physical, it could be in the family, it could be at your job. There's a lot of things it could be. Are you, have you ever been like at the end of your rope and you had to tie a knot at the end of the rope to hang on and you feel like your fingers are slipping because you're losing your grip? Let me ask you a question. When you're in that situation, do you believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? Because if you don't, I tell you what you're not going to experience. You're not going to experience that coming to him. That ability to uh, have him there and give you peace that passes all understanding. And so that's the reason that we rejoice. That Jesus brings justice. Here's the second thing. And and the last two won't be very long. Number two, he brings justice as the Lion of Judah. Now, we can read throughout Revelation and other places uh, that he is that Lion of Judah. Let let me just read to you uh, from uh, Revelation 5, 5. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus is worthy. And then in Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. See my servant whom I uphold, um, my chosen one in whom I delight. I have put my spirit upon him and he will reveal justice to the nations of the world. He will be gentle. He will not shout nor quarrel in the streets. He will not break the bruised reed nor quench the dimly burning flame. He will encourage the faint hearted who's, who's those tempted to despair He will see full justice given to all of those who have been wronged and he won't be satisfied until truth and righteousness prevail throughout the earth, nor until even distant lands beyond the seas have put their faith in him. Do you see why this is important? Okay, he brings it to order. He brings it to where it's right. He brings justice for the oppressed. You're gonna get justice one day. He brings justice to the oppressors. There are going to be people that are going to stand before God and they're going to be held to account. Those oppressors. He's going to bring justice to the cosmic order of things, okay? And so that's what he promises through his justice. And then this is the last thing. Because he judges as the warrior king. Remember, he's the lamb. He justifies. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is the warrior king. He judges as the warrior king. And they sung the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the lamb saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the almighty. Just and true are your ways, O king of nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Then Revelation 17, 14, they will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. One good thing, if you're a believer, you're gonna be with him. And you know what he says about you? You're going to be with him. 
He says, you're chosen. Now, maybe you're one of those that didn't get chosen a lot. Maybe it started in elementary school and you were the last one chosen for the kickball team because you could not chew gum and walk straight at the same time. I'm not saying you were uncoordinated, but you couldn't walk across the gym floor without tripping over the line of paint, all right? Maybe you were not chosen uh, to be on uh, the team in high school. Maybe you were not chosen to be a cheerleader. Maybe you were not chosen to be on the debate team or whatever it is that you wanted to do. And maybe you feel like for you, all of life has been about just this missing out. You know what God says about you? That's my chosen one. That's my chosen one. Guess what that means? You're on the first team. It means God chooses you first. Some of you don't know what that feels like, but oh my, you're gonna be that in heaven. And you're gonna know beyond any doubt how much he loves you. He chooses us. Well, I don't have time. Let let me go ahead and read just these last verses. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 20. And then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and one sitting on it called faithful and true. In case you're wondering who that is, that's Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Remember, he's the conquering king. He's the warrior king. Um, His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, in other words, crowns. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Remember that rod of iron is for the enemies, it's not for you. And he had a robe dipped in blood signifying two things. One, that he died on the cross for our sins and that's how he is the justifier. That's how he is just. That's how he is righteous as a judge. But also that that represents that he conquers everything in the end. Jesus wins. Everything is going to be okay because Jesus wins. And I realize that probably in our modern culture, we would not choose to give that picture. He's got a robe dipped in the blood of his enemies. Seems rather graphic, doesn't it? Um, And, you know, we're, in my opinion, way, 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 way too sensitive in our culture nowadays. Um, I just believe that people... Uh, It blows my mind that, you know, people can think that a word equals violence. I don't think it does. But nevertheless, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. That's what it's teaching us. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw the beast And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who is in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now, why do we rejoice there? Because Jesus triumphs over evil. Jesus judges sinful governments, uh, evil false religion, oppression, and most of all, he judges Satan, the one that has deceived the world throughout all of the ages, the one that has tripped us up so often, the ones that comes after you, all of his strength and all of his might, he is going to be defeated. He is going to be put in the lake of fire forever and ever, and we're going to stand there victorious, victorious over what Jesus has done. So what do we learn? Jesus wins. And I don't know about you, but in light of that, I rejoice in the judgment that he brings. Because there's going to be justice for us one day, and the devil himself is going to be put into hell for all of eternity. And I am looking forward to that day. Because I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do, 
but it might be something like, na 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 hey, hey, goodbye. Anybody looking forward to doing that one day? And uh, so you can rebuke him in the name of Jesus because he has no power of youth because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, church. That's why we rejoice. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, and what you're going to do in the future. We know that you're the Lord over all of history and that um, you have a plan and a purpose and you're fulfilling it and you win. And we just so thank you for that. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there's anyone online or in the room that will say, Pastor Richie, I need to receive Jesus today. I don't want to be the one receiving the wrath of God. I want to receive the grace of God. Well, I've got good news for you. The Bible tells us when we recognize that we don't do this by being good, by joining a church or helping little old ladies across the street, we don't get to heaven or be made right with God because we are good people. We get made right with God because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection, and he gives us his grace. And that's why the Bible says in Romans that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that word call, it doesn't just simply mean to give a verbal assent to. It's an act of faith, okay? And here's what I know. When you call out in faith, God answers that prayer. So online, listen closely. Call on the name of Jesus right now. Say this. Dear Jesus, I call on you to save me. That's all you got to do. God, I want you to save me. And you believe that, and God promises that he'll answer that prayer. In the room today, all you got to do is call out and ask, and he'll do it gladly. Gladly, he'll do that. And all you need to do, you don't even have to say it out loud, but in your heart, dear Jesus, I'm calling on you. I wonder, just simply by show of hands, if there's anybody in the room today that would say, Pastor, I want to do that right now. I've not done that before. I'm not sure about it, but I would like to know it and I'd like to be settled in my heart. I'd like Jesus to be my savior and I want to call on him right now to be my savior. Would you raise your hand? Anybody in the room like that today? I want to call on Jesus today and follow him as my savior. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Uh, I would like for you to fill out a next step card. I'm going to talk about in just a second. If you're online, Go to the bottom of the page. You can fill out your next step card and you can click on there that you pray to receive Christ today. So let me finish my prayer of encouragement for you. Father, help us to be encouraged because you bring justice. Lord, we love you for that. We thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.